Today, I'm continuing our series in the book of Ephesians. Last week, if you weren't here, I had talked about what it means to be the adopted children of God. Uh, This is how the Apostle Paul describes it, beginning at verse 4 of chapter 1, where he says that even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. And this is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. And so we praise God for the glorious grace he's poured out on us who belong to his dear son. So, you know, without going through the whole message uh, from last week, essentially when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, we become the sons and daughters of God. And as the children of God, we inherit incredible spiritual blessings. Again, I described some of these last week. They begin here at verse 14, where you know, it says that we're chosen. We are made holy, deemed, and all of our sins have been forgiven. Uh, we're given spiritual wisdom and understanding. And that's just in Ephesians. Elsewhere throughout the Bible, you find other blessings. Uh, for example, it's, uh, we learned that we've been given a spirit of power and a strong mind and that we have the dead raising power of Jesus Christ living inside of us. And in addition to that, we've been given spiritual authority and freedom from fear and condemnation. And best of all, we have this living hope of a new heaven and a new earth where God himself will be wiping every tear from our eyes. There will be no more sickness, no more pain, no more death crying anymore. And all of that and more really belongs to you and belongs to me as the adopted children of God. And it is worthy of, you know, hooting and hollering about it. I mean, that is the salvation. That is the fullness of the salvation and the redemption that Jesus offers to anybody who will freely accept it, believing in his death and his resurrection. And I know many of you who are sitting here today and many of you who are watching at home, um, you made that decision to receive Christ as your Savior, and I'm sure that it radically changed your life. It did me when I was 12 and my Uncle Joe led me to Jesus. Uh, It did begin a a life-changing work in me. Some of you, you've been saved longer than I have, maybe even before I was even born. But, you know, whatever the case may be... (laughs) um, When you made that decision to accept Christ, you became an adopted child of God with all of the benefits and blessings that I have just uh, shared with you right now. But here's a, a question that I want to pose to you. In the time between when you accepted Christ and became his adopted child and today, have you ever questioned your salvation. What I mean is that, have you ever experienced that sense of fear and anxiety that maybe you aren't really saved? Um, now, maybe it was on the heels of a rough night or, um, or a rough week or maybe a rough year where you wandered off like the prodigal son and you engaged in destructive behaviors that you thought you'd long since been delivered from that you long since promised God that you would never engage in again. And in doing that, you're left with this terrifying sense that you've fallen far beyond God's grace. Maybe you committed the unforgivable sin uh, or that you've exhausted the patience of God. And for that reason, you're convinced that he's done with you. Am I the only one who's ever felt like that? Anybody ever felt like that? Well, the rest of you are lying and you should probably question your salvation (laughs) because... He's all lying, man. I mean, I, I mean, I mentioned this to you before, but from the time that I received Christ when I was 12, really probably up until the age of 22, every time I went to church and every time a pastor gave an altar call, I marched right on up and received Christ again and again. I mean, I, 
I, was, I, I saw the value, I saw the beauty and the meaning of what it was that Jesus Christ had done for me. And I wanted so badly to do good and to follow Jesus. The intent was there. But the very things that I promised God and myself that I wouldn't do were the very things that I would be doing that weekend or that night. And I would suffer the consequences of my actions. And because of that, for a long time, I never really had any assurance that if I were to die in the act of committing these destructive sins that I did, my reckless behavior, I had no assurance that I would enter into the gates of heaven. I had no assurance that I was truly saved. And so I took every opportunity to invite and re-invite Christ into my life, recommitting over and over again. Um, and it's an exhausting, fear-producing, anxiety-producing way of approaching your salvation with the Lord. Um, but what if I told you that there was a way that you and I could experience a more confident hope, uh, a greater sense of security in the reality that when you received the free gift of eternal life that Christ offered you, it came with a 100% guarantee that God will make good on his promise to save you completely. We, you can be as confident as the Apostle Paul who said this. This is the Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. He said, I am certain that God, certain that God, who began the good work within you and me, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. I stopped uh, responding to altar calls, you know, long ago. I'm 40, whatever I am right now, uh, a long time ago. 25 years ago, I think I did the math here, when I finally began to grasp, or began to grasp, yeah, an important truth that's communicated to us here in the book of Ephesians, in chapter 1. Um, so I'm going to read to you what it says, beginning at verse uh, 11. It'll be up on the screen for you. This is what it says. In him, it's, uh, in Jesus, we have obtained an inheritance. I like this because there's kind of this past tenseness. Speaking of, we already have it. I talked about that last weekend. But in Jesus, we have obtained an inheritance in him we've obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of God, who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Sounds kind of, it might be hard to grasp, but this is what I want you to catch here in, in verse 13. When you heard the word of truth, which is the gospel of your salvation, Christ crucified and raised again, okay, and believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. I just want to stop here really quickly because it, in seeing uh, these verses, you might think that Paul is contradicting himself because I was talking about the past tenseness of having had the inheritance, but then he also says, uh, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. So it seems... Like he's talking out two sides of his mouth, but he's not. This is something that certain Bible teachers call already, the already and not yet of our salvation. Uh, like for example, in Colossians chapter one or two, verse 15, it very clearly says that the devil has been defeated. This is a great verse. It just marched these demonic powers who once had authority and power over you when you were under the power of Satan. Um, he's destroyed their influence over you. Uh, and yet it's obvious that the effects of the devil and his influence are visible throughout the world. All you have to do is turn on the news and see how jacked up our world is right now to know that the devil is still active. And then you look at your life, and, and I look at my life, and the things that I do sometimes, and I realize that the devil and his influence are still very real. What's going on there? Well, the devil is defeated, and yet we know that he's allowed to continue on until the end when he is finally cast into the lake of fire. So here's how an excellent theologian by the name of F.F. F. Bruce says it. He explains it this way. He says, redemption is already ours through the sacrifice and death of Christ. 
But one aspect of our redemption, which is our resurrection, remains to be realized. So on the day of resurrection, God will redeem his own possession, which is you and me. And the proof of his commitment to do so is this sealing of the Holy Spirit. So, yes, we have been redeemed, and there's a portion of our spiritual inheritance that we get to enjoy right here in this life presently. But there's also an inheritance that is reserved for us on the other side of this life, where one day we will finally see Jesus face to face and we'll we'll be united with those of the faith who've gone before us. Praise God for that. Um, And where God one day is going to restore everything back to the way that he originally intended to be. And what God communicates to us here through the Apostle Paul uh, is that our redemption and our salvation, our resurrection, our our future inheritance is guaranteed. Um, This is Ephesians. Let me read this one here in a second. You were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with the seal, the Holy Spirit of promise, who is a deposit guaranteeing your inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. And I love this because you see, I don't pretend to understand this doctrine of the Trinity very well. It's a very complicated thing. I've tried for years to wrap my mind around it and I can't quite do it. But what I do see here in this particular verse is the Trinity at work at the same time. If you see that it's, it's in him, in Christ, we were sealed with the Holy Spirit and God is the one who did it. So you see them all active in this saving work. Uh, so this sealing, what, what is this seal of the Holy Spirit? There's an example in the Old Testament of what it is to seal something. Uh, it's found in the book of Esther. It's Esther 8, verse 8. And I won't tell you the whole story, but essentially Esther, she goes to King Xerxes uh, begging him, to please allow us to smoke Haman. This guy's just a real jerk. Um, and so the, the King Xerxes says, I'll grant that. Uh, I'll grant your request. But he says this. Listen to what he says. So he says to Esther, okay, write a decree in the king's name on behalf of the Jews, as it seems best to you, and seal it with the king's signet ring for no uh, document written in the king's name and sealed with his ring can be revoked. So there's this edict, there's a decree that the king makes. He has a ring, there's usually wax that they place on there and then he seals it and that's on lock and anybody touches that will get smoked, I'm sure. But it really assures that this particular decree is going to get to its intended recipient and and it stands firm, this decree. It it can't be revoked, as he said. Well, in, in a much more profound way, God made a decree, and that decree, found all over the scriptures, but specifically I'll just point out Romans chapter 10, verse 9, um, where he says, if you confess with your mouth, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That is the decree. You believe it, and then, as he says in Ephesians uh, chapter 1, you are then sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, and it can't be revoked. You know, in fact, I don't know if you know this, this is something that I actually only learned in the last a couple of weeks studying this, because I've seen it, but I, I kind of missed it. But did you know that you can't even say that Jesus is Lord without the Holy Spirit prompting you to do that? This is 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3. Um, he says, Paul, I want you to know that no one speaking by the Spirit of God will curse Jesus, okay? But he also says, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. I think that's, uh, this is one little bit of, I don't know, evidence, I would say, that you, in fact, have received Christ as your Savior. This is one piece of evidence as you declare Jesus is Lord that it's highly likely if you did that by faith, that you are now sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise as a down payment, as he says, guaranteeing your inheritance 
until the redemption of those, which is us, uh, God's possession. And here's how the message version of the Bible says it. It says, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. This down payment from God is the first installment on what's coming, a reminder that we'll get everything that God has planned for us, a praising and glorious life. And so this is speaking of this moment in the future when we're going to exchange these frail, jacked up in some cases, uh, not mine, but some of yours, (laughs) frail, uh, mortal body, um, and exchange it for an immortal, indestructible one. See, when Jesus left this earth, he promised that he's going to prepare a place for us. But he says, I go prepare a place for you, but I will come back again. He promised he's going to prepare that place, and then he's going to one day come back to receive those of us who he has purchased with his own blood, his prized, cherished possession, which is you and me. So that is the ceiling of us by the Holy Spirit. And then I, with the Holy Spirit, there's a difference. By and with, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. But then I started thinking about this down payment thing, and I was trying to think of examples of, you know, some kind of earthly example of the spiritual reality. And the only thing I had come up with was Kmart, which sounds <laughs> really dumb, but I'll explain, because I had to confirm with my mom this morning about this, but I could remember being little, maybe, maybe six or seven, and going way in the back of Kmart, and my mom, when we were, we were, we were broke, bless her heart, and, you know, in love, she would go and pick up items, clothing that she wanted for me and my brothers, and she would go to that counter, and she'd put a little bit of dough on that, laying claim on that merchandise, and because of her love for us, she would go continue to go back and back again, making little payments until finally she was able to receive that merchandise as her own and bring it on home to us. My mom's love ensured that she would do that. And um, in a sense, the Holy Spirit, similarly, it's a partial payment of the full inheritance that God will give us later. So I don't know, Kmart, I don't know if that was a good example. So I've tried to come up with, I've, I've thankfully found another translation of this particular verse and it inspired a, you know, a different a way of looking at this. Uh, this is Ephesians chapter 1, verses 11 and 14. And this is the passion translation of the scriptures where it says this. When you heard the revelation of truth and believed in the wonderful news of salvation in Christ, you were stamped with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the part I want you to catch. This is what has, has struck me. He's given to us like an engagement ring as the first installment of what's coming. Yeah, I like that. It's pretty. He is our hope and the promise of a future inheritance which seals us until we have all of redemption's promises and experience complete freedom, all for the supreme glory and honor of God. And the reason I like that is because God often uses the analogy of marriage in terms of our relationship with Jesus. I mean, we are, after all, the bride of Christ. And I was reading about Jewish culture and, and marriage. And back then, in those days, and in a lot of other cultures, the, the father of the groom would go out and try to find a suitable, he would choose a suitable bride for his son. And then after the father of the groom believed that he had found that woman, well, he would then go to the parents and the bride, her family, and there would be a written uh, marriage agreement that was made. And after the agreement was finalized, it was customary for the father to give a gift to the father of the bride. And that gift, in a sense, was a deposit. Uh, It served as a guarantee that his son, the groom, would follow through with his intentions to marry the young lady. And once that deposit was made, the intent to marry would be official. Let me, I'll read just this little bit here. Uh, The Jewish wedding traditions 
like many of the Jewish traditions, mirror the spiritual realm. See, just as the father of the groom selects the bride, so God the Father has chosen to give the church as a bride to his son. And just as the father of the groom leaves a gift representing a promise that he will make good on that marriage contract, so God seals you with the gift of his Holy Spirit, which is his divine promise, guaranteeing that the Lord will come back for you. You know, and of course, we still do that today. When I first moved up here, uh, Charlene was in California, and we weren't yet together. I traveled down there one fine Thanksgiving, and I gave her, uh, you know, an engagement ring, asked her to marry me, and that was sort of this deposit saying, baby, I'll be back in, it, it's not soon enough, but it was, that was in November, I, two, December, January 8th, we were married, January 8th, right? 13th, sorry. January 8th is the, sorry, my, my brother passed away. My brother passed away on January 8th. Look, look it up. Wow. Whew, I got like hot. Anyway, the point was that, I know. That engagement ring was my way of saying, I love you, I am committed to you, I will come back for you and bring you up here to Oregon where you're gonna be, I mean, just the most happiest girl ever. Uh, <laughs> anyway, but, you know, and in much the same way, when we were sealed with the Holy Spirit, you know, we were essentially you know, betrothed to Jesus. The Holy Spirit serves as that engagement ring that confirms confirms us as the bride of Christ, uh, but as his beloved bride, bride, it also confirms that we can be confident that he's going to make good on his promise to come back for us and take us to be home with him forever. So I'll start to wind this down because I know some still wonder, uh, well, how do I know, though, if I've really been sealed with the Holy Spirit? I don't feel it, and I understand that. Um, Ultimately, say that we have to, this is a faith issue. We have to put our faith in what the word of God says and not our feelings. See, God said, when you believe the message, right, that you heard the good news of Christ and salvation, and you believed it and you professed Christ as Lord, well, he says, if, when you do that, you are sealed. God said it and we have to believe it, right? So God doesn't lie. When he says that, you can rest assured in his word. But, okay, maybe that's not enough for you. I think that there are other ways that you can be assured that you have the Holy Spirit. I mentioned one of them already. If you can say that Jesus is Lord, that is the Holy Spirit actively at work in you. That says something. Because, as you know, there's a world of unbelievers out there who want nothing to do with Jesus. They do not believe he's Lord. If you're saying that, I mean, there's evidence there that you are his and that you've been sealed. I would point you to the book of Galatians. There's, you, there's fruit, at least there should be in your life, that the Holy Spirit produces increasingly. You have to look at your life, and I know that you testify that while you're still immature in certain ways, still jacked up in some areas, you can see a significant difference in who you were versus who you are now. Your attitudes, certain destructive ways of thinking, certain destructive behaviors and habits and addictions, you've been released from them or increasingly being released from them. I mean, if really, if you're out there mean as a snake, full of hate and bitterness and rage, given over to a, a lifestyle, a pattern of lust. And I mean, there's something not quite right. You should be able to examine your life and see fruit. And it's the Holy Spirit that produces that in you. So if you can see that marked difference in you, I would say there's evidence there of your being sealed with the Holy Spirit. And I would add to that conviction again, because if when you and I are engaged in behaviors that we know we shouldn't. 
the next morning, you're going to be saying to yourself, Lord Jesus, I don't know what I was thinking. I don't know why I continue to do the very thing that I said I didn't want to do. Romans chapter 7, many of you know this chapter speaks of this internal struggle. Paul says, man, the things that I don't want to do, I do. The things that, I, however he says it, it's kind of complicated, but essentially it's summed up in that. That's why even though when I was 12 and I was with this back and forth and this coming to every altar call, you know what? That was, a, that was an indication that I was sealed with the Holy Spirit because God was at work in me trying to convict me and produce righteousness. And it was just immaturity. You know, I was, a, I was carnal. Sometimes I surprise myself I can still be carnal in some ways, but super duper carnal back in the day. You know, if you have that sense of conviction when you do something, that's the Holy Spirit in you. He sealed you and he's producing righteousness in you. That's what he does. There's, it, we'll get to this in Ephesians 5 uh, when we start talking about marriage. But Jesus is preparing his bride. That's what, I'll read it to you. Uh, let me see. Is this it? Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So he's talking about the comparison again with husbands, wives, Christ in the church. Uh, he gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. That's what Christ is at work in your life, and there should be a sense of conviction when you're doing something wrong. Now, again, if you're not experiencing that and you're continuing on in, in these destructive sins and not sensing any conviction, I would just ask you to go to the Lord and pray, asking him to reveal uh, those areas that are blatantly sinful and receive the, the power that's actually already yours to make those changes. So, you've professed Jesus as the Lord. You can see fruit in your life and you recognize that there is a conviction. You find you're not perfect, but you see that you're, what you're doing is wrong and you're trying to move forward and leave that behind. That's the Holy Spirit at work in your life. That is proof of his sealing and that Holy Spirit of promise being on your life. And ultimately, I'm not trying to put a, a works-based thing on you because you know me and that's not what I want to talk. In fact, I'll be talking about that soon, about the grace in which we've been saved and it's not by works. We'll, we'll get to that. I'm not trying to leap, a, 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 just load a burden on you. Um, but I want you to know that the, God's at work in you and he's going to bring it to completion. That's his promise. And I'll just read this and I'll close it out. This is what the Apostle Peter says. This is the the work of God in your life as an adopted child of God. He says, all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's by his great mercy that we have been born again. Because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, now we live with great expectation and we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you. And it's pure and it's undefiled. It's beyond the reach of change and decay. And through your faith, through your faith, listen, God is protecting you. He's protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation. He's at work. He's going to assure that you get at your intended destination because you've been sealed with that signet ring. The devil has no power over you. But God is protecting you by his power until you receive the salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. And so, be truly glad because there's a wonderful joy ahead. Hallelujah. All right. Uh, just uh, I'll, your worship team can come up here. I just want to tell you, yesterday I went to a friend's house, a, a magician buddy of mine, incredibly talented sleight of hand artist. But he's on hospice. You know, and he's very frail confined to a wheelchair and just you know it's sad because the way they're you know the way they're talking they're already making funeral arrangements it's um, but what was amazing to me is we didn't even and I, you know I, I'm passionate about this art of sleight of hand and so is he he's amazing we didn't hardly talk even two sentences about that our whole conversation revolved around his hope in Jesus Christ he said 
I'm not scared. I know where I'm going. I'm assured that I'm going to enter into the presence of God. And so, am I fearful? I'd be lying if I'd said I'm not, there's not a certain degree of fear, but um, more about pain associated to it or all. But, he's, but I know where I'm going. I thought, man, what? this is what I'm talking about. He has that confident hope of where he's going. And I, I want you and I to live with this same degree of hope, uh, not just on the day when we're preparing to meet the Father and see Christ face to face, but in the right here and in the right now. And I would say if anybody here has not come to this point of receiving the free gift, don't, don't wait. You watching at home, I know some people tune in and not everyone here has received this gift. And so I don't, unfortunately, there's no reason for you to be experiencing a sense of security or assurance of anything apart from Christ and him crucified and resurrected and the hope of eternal life. And so there's nothing extravagant that you have to do except say, I hear what Rudy's saying. I really want that. Jesus, I don't know much about who you are, but I want to invite you into my life and I'm going to declare you as Lord and he will become your life, not just in your life or a part of it. Jesus, it says, is our life and his life is eternal and you could experience eternity with him by simply saying, I want that. Jesus is Lord and the Holy Spirit will seal you and you're going to begin to see a work taking place in your life over an extended period of time. He's still working stuff out of my life. Huh, baby? Yeah. All right. So please take us up on that. And then go to oldtownfg.com, and we have a starting point class that will expand on what I'm sharing with you and get you some of these foundational truths that you can rest your faith in, all right? So you're already blessed. <laughs> all right. Uh, let me pray for you, and then we're going to spend some time enjoying the Lord in worship. Father, I thank you. Thank you for your goodness, your kindness. Thank you for this wonderful gift that you offer freely to anyone who will simply believe. And in believing and declaring you as Lord, by the prompting of your Holy Spirit, they will be sealed. And in that sealing comes a promise that the work that you begin in them will continue until you finally complete it on that day when we meet you face to face. I pray for those who are just uh, maybe for the first time making this commitment to finally receive this gift, Father, where there might be some trepidation or some sense of doubt or uncertainty, Lord, um, Holy Spirit, uh, soften their hearts, uh, give them understanding that they'd be able to grasp the truths that I'm trying my best to communicate here this morning. And in so doing, receive the gift of eternal life and your Holy Spirit. Performed on my own life. I have a long way to go, but thank you for the way that you're working in me and the way you're working in many of my brothers and sisters in this place. We praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen.